Um, I'm going to continue a little bit today with the powder metal side that we started at the beginning of the week with the talk from Keith Murray from Sandwich. Um, better turn off that email or it was going to be. Um, so there's already one lecture on Blackboard, which is e-lecture six. But I'm going to run through some of that very quickly. And it's about the characterization of metal powders. Um, Keith, in the lecture on Monday, um, talked a little bit about how powders get characterized. Um, and he talked a little bit about their specific gas atomization process. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to generalize a little bit more on that. And I'm going to talk about through different other uh, manufacturing processes, which are not necessarily the ones he uses. Uh, <coughs> I understand powder metallurgy is a little bit powder, the manufacturing of powders and powders themselves can be a, of a dry subject, apparently. So, um, uh, but what I want to do is just recap where we are at the moment and what we're going to be doing to the rest of the term. Um, so, we've, we've covered in a bit of a sort of jumping order, but there was method behind that madness because I was trying to get things to you that normally in the past we've taught later on in the course and specifically that was the process control um, and the design for additive manufacturing because I wanted you to have that information to be able to take into the projects. Okay, um, So we've, we've been through the uh, introduction of different uh, um, additive manufacturing processes. Um, we've looked at applications of additive manufacturing. Um, we, we've I think covered quite well the mechanics of additive manufacturing and through the fact that you've actually had parts made and you've seen the machine, I think you've got a better idea of certainly the powder bed system that we use. Um, we've come to the point where I've added more lectures on here at the end of the module because by request from you guys, uh, you wanted to have more lectures rather than online lectures. That's fine. But so that probably means you're going to be looking at we're going to be doing Mondays and Fridays now. Uh, Mondays 4 till 5 and then this slot on the Friday as well. Um, this week we, we've been covering powder metals and I'll finish that off today. Uh, and then next week we're going to do uh, the chapter 7 on additive material properties. So the properties of uh, materials made by additive uh, and how we test them and what kind of results, what kind of tensile strengths, what kind of uh, properties you expect from um, additive materials. Uh, and then a final chapter 8, which is simulation of AM, which is going to be a very short uh, intro to uh, different aspects of simulation uh, of additive manufacturing. And then we'll start on the examples classes. So we should be able to have at least three examples classes, one in week 32 and two in week 33, where it'll be a bit dry and we'll go through typical worked examples. Um, there's a big worked examples document on Blackboard anyway, and we're going to pretty much be picking out a few of those and following them through. Okay, so that's, that's the plan now till the end of term. Um, we've also obviously got on Monday um, the presentations. So we've got a panel of five. Uh, it's meant to be in the gist of it. It's going to be fun. Uh, the parts have come out of the trough there, and they're all looking quite nice. There's a few more coming off the plate. You can go with me later on to the pilot line. We'll get them off the plate and put, put them on the trough afterwards in the afternoon. Um, and I think that if you remember that uh, briefing document for the project, basically the first seven criteria are the most important from the perspective of the parts that you've made. Uh, the idea was to have multifunctionality uh, or some particularly interesting um, functionality of the part that the part couldn't be made by any other means. That it was specifically made to be made by, specifically designed to be made by additive manufacturing, that you've incorporated some thought process behind what you've done. I know all of this is, you, you've seen it all before, but that's more or less what the, the five guys on the, on the panel will be looking at on, on uh, Monday will be just to see if you've met the brief or that sort of thing and, and uh, 
bottle of bubbly. I'll see if I can get some beers in as well. So it will probably overrun. I know that we'll have, uh, uh, we've got an hour booked, but we'll probably go over, I'm sure. And I don't know if it, you know, I don't know how much. We'll try to keep it on time. So that's okay. Any questions on the structure so far? Anything else you want to bring up now? Because otherwise I'm going to plow ahead, and that's the plan to end of term that way. You've got the final report due in on the 18th of May, is that right? Was that the date we, f we set? Yeah? So that's very close to the exams. Yeah? So I, I must admit, I was a bit worried about setting that date, but that's the date we set, so that's what it is. Um, you know the layout. Um, yeah, uh, and I think then on the week commencing the 23rd, sometime, did have, I, I did have an email through yesterday about the final timetable for the exams. Does anybody know the timetable for this, the exam for this module? Yeah. Which date, sorry? 22nd. 22nd, yeah. right. That's a Tuesday. Is that? Okay. Right, okay, well. I'll, I'll make sure there's an announcement on Blackboard so we all know exactly <laughs> what the date is. Okay, so, right, I'm just going to um, start with e-letter six. It's on Blackboard uh, anyway. I uploaded it at the end of um, March, just before, just into the Easter recess. Um, and, and the reason I'm going to go through faster, so as I said, because Keith covered quite a bit of that on Monday. You've got that online. I just want to finish off this week with the powder side of things. It's, you know, it is uh, going to be an increasingly important part of this technology is the qualification of good quality powder uh, and bringing down the costs of powders because they are, uh, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of processing to, um, to make them. So steel isn't you know, two or three pounds a kilo is 60 pounds a kilo. And titanium isn't 100 pounds a kilo, it's 300 pounds a kilo. So that extra processing by putting it through the gas atomizer to get the powder creates much uh, 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 an added cost to the powders, which means that even if you are saving by not uh, wasting material by making something that's net shape, you know, there's still a trade-off um, with what you can make. So, th and the importance of the powders is there. Uh, and uh, to a certain extent, the manufacturers of the machines are saying, we make really good parts, but the powder needs to be better. And the powder manufacturers are saying, we make very good powder, it's the machines that have to be better. So at that moment, there's still a bit of, you know, uh, the, where the truth is. But what, what exactly makes a good powder? Well, that's partly why you need to know what the character, how to um, describe a powder, how to um, measure properties of powders. Um, and... The, the impact then is quite a complex impact with how that um, uh, uh, reacts with the laser, so to speak, fuses with, with lasers. Um, so the flowability of the powder, particle size distributions, particle morphology, so the morphology is the shape of the powder. And because with one powder particle only being 15 to 45 microns, we're talking millions of particles. The, everything we talk about is a statistical uh, average of, uh, the, uh, of the powder itself. Obviously the composition, um, then tap density and apparent density and, and thermal properties also contribute to how our specific powder will, uh, will, will work. Um, these are interlinked properties. So the shape of the powder will uh, will also um, will affect how it, the, dens the density of the powder, how they lock together in uh, a complete form. The size distributions uh, are also linked. Uh, they obviously link onto the flow properties. So if you've got very jagged powders and lots of different sizes, it's going to flow not quite as well as something which is very round. Um, and all of these come down to how you make them. Uh, and there are essentially four different ways of making powders. Uh, the main one that Keith spoke to you la uh, on Monday was about gas atomization, and that generally is the process. Uh, but there are various flavors. 
uh, of the, what I call the mother of the physical processes, the gas atomization processes. Um, but I am going to run through um, in, the in e lecture 7 through mechanical and electrolytical properties. But how they're made, how they're made affects um, size, shape, microstructure chemistry, and also obviously their cost. Um, when you look at these powders, they've got some weird and wonderful shapes. You could spend the rest of your life looking down microscopes and just looking at all the different powder particles because they, they really are quite interesting. So you can see examples of uh, gas atomized there. Uh, and um, some which are uh, more f uh, from, from different processes uh, will we'll have properties which you would, here you have, um, you can see this probably been either mechanically alloyed or, but we'll go into more details later. All the different shapes can be kind of, yeah. The particle shapes. So, yeah, um, often what we do is we just look down a microscope and we'll take representative samples, look down the microscope. Scanning electron microscope is probably the best. Um, and then just almost by eye, you qualify, you say it's coming, you know, you're not going to do every particle, you're just doing a, a scattered number of them. But more recently, in the last couple of years, um, a system which is called Malvern, uh, they, they they're based actually in Malvern. Um, they've, they've always done powder size distributions. And they've come up with a new system which actually takes snapshot photographs, images of the particles as they're being put in front of the X-ray, uh, uh, the um, uh, laser diffraction system. They're taking images at the same time. So they can take size fractions and they can associate particle morphology and you can generalize upon that. So it's quite an advanced system. It's very, very expensive. <laughs> We haven't got access to one, unfortunately. So most of us, most of our work when we're looking at powders is literally we just put it on a, on a, a carbon tab uh, and we stick that in the microscope, electron microscope and we'll take, you know, uh, 500 micron by 500 micron patches and we'll just, you know, you can use image analysis which renders it, thresholds it into black and white and you can get a shape and it'll tell you the, circuit, the, the level of circularity, the you know, perimetry and all that can be done through algorithms. Yeah. Um, yeah, but generally you have this, this sort of uh, breakdown, uh, one dimensional, a circular, uh, you've got irregular, which might come through mechanical commission or is also ball milling. Uh, so the particles get broken up and broken up and broken up. Uh, you have dendritic when they're growing, like from an electrolytic uh, processes. Um, flaky. We're going to see more of this later on, so with some specific examples of powders coming from a specific process. What we're really interested in, obviously, is the spherical um, powders that come out of gas atomization. Um, but even with those, you can have um, aggregated uh, sets. You can have satellites off them, uh, and all of these can actually degenerate the way in which the, flower, the powder will flow into uh, the powder bed. Um, we'll often use uh, even if the powder isn't completely spherical, we will approximate uh, single powders by giving them sort of a, a fitting diameter. Um, so with that fit will come a series of fitted volumes and surface areas and things that we can generalize on, the, uh, on statistical averages of all the millions of particles that are in there. Um, Keith already went through a little bit of this, I think, last week as well. Um, so the different ways of uh, measuring the powder size uh, powder size distributions from sieving, which is actually uh, very robust, but can only do down to about 38 microns in a dry form. Then you're going to have a wet form. Uh, you have to have um, it actually done in water. But you can go down lower, right down to nano size powders using sieving. Um, the, um, the laser diffraction methods, um, are, which are here somewhere, uh, photo optical, no, um, I got it, um, they're probably, oh, there we are, laser, uh, laser diffraction, so they have the widest range of uh, being able to measure particles, um, uh, and they all, there are a couple of different systems, but the Malvern one, uh, there's an American one as well, but the Malvern one is almost an industry standard. Um, 
Sieving is another way of breaking it down. You literally just take the weight of powder. The sieves let the particles drop through, and you can accumulate on each sieve, and you weigh it up. The important thing to get to with that is you get a distribution curve, a, no, a, a normal, a log normal, a Gaussian distribution, uh, and that will tell you sort of um, what... And, and the weighing is fine. You'll have two different types of distributions. You'll have uh, the, uh, sort of the normal distribution, and then you'll have a cumulative distribution. And, and you can literally go between one and the other. Um, <coughs> not, these distributions don't necessarily have to be, and they don't, they're not always the case that they are completely symmetrical. Um, so when you've got a symmetrical, then um, we talk about the sort of medium size. Uh, we have a, uh, this dv um, way of... Uh, the dv 0.1 stands for all part, the, the, the size of particles under which 10% of the volume of particles is below that value. Um, but this mean, median, if you've got a non-symmetric distribution, will, uh, will be displaced, so then you have to talk about mode, median, and mean. Um, this has been um, sort of one of the questions is to take a maybe a normal distribution, put it into a cumulative distribution, and then work out what these um, D10, D50, and uh, D90 size fractions are. It's actually a very simple exercise. Um, and I think I've got an example of it uh, here, whereby you literally have the distribution, uh, you've got a percentage uh, cumulative distribution on the left-hand side, um, and you can pick out the size at which the, for example, uh, if you're looking for the D10, you come across at 10%, and it will tell you the size of particles which are within that um, size fraction. Here's one from uh, an actual uh, additive powder itself, uh, and you can see uh, that the D10 is 20 micron, the D50 is 45 micron, and the D90 is 60 micron. So that means that there are uh, it, the, 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 that 10 percent of the particles are below the 10 micron size, and that about uh, 10 percent of the mi uh, particles are above the 60 micron size, and everything else lies in between the two. So that's not to say there couldn't be the odd, you know, 300 micron particle in there, but it really doesn't add to the distribution. It doesn't modify the distribution much because there might be only one or two of them. Um, density uh, um, and packing factor. Um, Keith also mentioned these as well. So uh, the true density is obviously the density of the alloy itself. Um, as if it was a solid rather than a powder. Now, the apparent density is if you were just to drop that powder straight into a little flask, and you can take the volume, and then obviously you would be, uh, typically there'll be a voids, voids amongst the particles, which adds, lowers the overall density. So you can often have 50% or even uh, less dense material. So you have the real density could be like for titanium, would be 4.2 grams per cubic centimeter. And then the apparent density of the powder would be even more like two, two grams per cubic centimetre. Okay? But you can compact that, and one of the tests is the tap test, where you would just put it, literally put it in a vial, and you tap it, and I think it's like 11 taps, and that's just enough for it to tumble over each other, condense, and then you'll get a slightly higher density, and that is the tap density. So a lot of the tests that have been designed for powders are actually quite simple. Um, there are m more complex systems uh, to which, like the rheometer, uh, which allows you to get not just flow properties, but uh, they're not really as well established as the old methods. Um, this is a, a part of the problem is that you can have, for example, uh, this, the, 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 the packing factor here shows uh, how you can have uh, the size distribution, so if you have a mono size uh, set of powders, uh, it actually gives you a lower packing factor, packing density, than if you have a combination of large and low ones, because all the small little particles get between the grooves and they fill it out, and that is actually denser. So that, that follows a pattern. Another very simple test, um, which is standardized, is the Hall flow test. And that just, they pour it through and they time how quickly the powder goes through and fills up the. Uh, the bottom container. Uh, there's a standard for that. Again, um, Keith mentioned these, so I'm just going to shoot through them. 
The, the morphology of the powder will affect the flow, um, uh, but it will also affect not just the flow rate, but it will also affect the, 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 um, the apparent density. Um, so you can see that the, the quite angular dendritic don't want to sit together very well. They'll often leave large gaps between them and voids, so you have low uh, apparent density. And then if you've got spherical powders, they will want to pack better. Um, and also uh, the aspect ratio. So if you have uh, a higher aspect ratio of particles, so you can see in this, this simulation here, these are measured um, at the top. So as your aspect ratio goes up, uh, your uh, flow rate um, also goes up. Um, with all of these, I mean, this is all refer, trying to refer back to what we're doing in the machine. And when you pull the powder across into the powder bed, um, you, you have a starting density of the powder. The denser that is, the denser your part's going to be. So um, it is important. Um, so particle size itself obviously uh, has a, an, an influence on the apparent density. Um, so as your um, particle size goes up, your apparent density goes up. Um, and, but as your particle size goes up, your whole flow rate um, uh, will, will go down. Sorry, your whole flow rate comes down as well. Um, right, four powder sizes in AM. Uh, the three different processes we have here. SLM or selective laser melting is the same as our powder bed fusion, uh, laser powder bed fusion. Uh, typically will be between 15 and 45, but up to possibly with aluminium powders, you'll be going up higher than 60. Blown powder will take a, a larger size fraction. Um, and the electron beam method also take larger size fractions of, um, of particles. This is very much related to the heat source of the laser or the electron beam. If they have wider beam widths, they can deal with melting larger particles. You want to simplify it like that. And I know if um, I asked Keith last week as well, one of the questions I asked him was, was it possible when they do a gas atomization trial, they'll come up with powder particles, uh, ranges of different sizes. Is it possible to kind of quite simply say, right, this goes off to that process, that goes off to another process, and that goes off to another process. So with one gas atomization run, they could potentially have the greatest productivity for them to be able to make money from every, other, every one of the size factors by sending it off to different processes. He said that once in a while that does happen, but not always, because they have quite narrow uh, distributions of particles. They can't always have the luxury of uh, picking out the, uh, different size factions. They will have to do different gas atomization runs with different settings to produce the different powder sizes. Um, just another summary from another paper from Rapid Prototyping, uh, an old one, just showing that you, you do have um, an effect. So uh, the finer the powder, the less surface roughness, and the, higher the, the less fine the powder, the higher surface roughness you get. So it's not really uh, rocket science, but it's you know, just to show that it does affect it. So one of the w different ways it affects it. Um, there are more... Um, sort of uh, intricate uh, method ways in which powder packing will uh, affect the melting. So this is a simulation showing a 45% packing density and a 38% packing, dens packing density. And you can see that the line that the laser is drawing across the powder is starting to break up with a lower packing density, which again is not conceptually difficult to understand, but it's when, when it comes down to trying to relate that to real powders, then it gets, um, doesn't often go beyond simulation. So um, I'm not going to run through all the conclusions because I want to do uh, the next part on um, uh, the different uh, manufacturing methods. Uh, so just to remember more than anything that the finer powders are required for the laser powder bed or selective laser melting. Um, so it's part, typically part, the nominal sizes will be 15 to 45 micron, uh, but then that will come through with specific measurements, which are provided by Melvin. So when, the powder, when, you, when you go to buy a powder from a manufacturer, uh, you will specify uh, the D10, the D50, and the D90. And you'll probably quite explicitly say, I want 20 microns there. I don't want any very fine particles, so can you cut off anything below 10 microns, 20 microns, and have no fines? Uh, for some powders, that's very important. Aluminium doesn't like to process very well if you've got a lot of fine particles in there. 
Um, so uh, they're often cut off um, below that 20 micron. Um, medium powders then are used for the electron beam process, we're typically in the 50 to 150 micron. And therefore, with that, you might specify a D10 of 51 micron, D50, 72, and a D90 of 109. So that's how you see that the Gaussian's been shifted to the right to the larger size, sizes. And then on the uh, laser cladding or blown powder systems, which might have very large uh, CO2 lasers, which will be, you know, up to one to five millimeter spot size, then you want to have larger powders to cover a larger area, and you can, you've got the power in the laser to be able to melt it. So I think those are sort of like the three things I'd really like you guys to remember in terms of uh, powder sizes and the, the influence and the, uh, what is used in different processes. Um, any questions on the characteristics of powder there? Nope. Okay. Well, in that case, um, we'll move on to um, seven. Now it's the manufacturing, which is what we're going to come back to. How would you separate them? So they, they will have um, sieving stations. I think um, Keith went into more detail than I can because they do that all the time. So they had a series of big sieving stations and they're able to do overcut, undercut, and then revert material going back into the process. Uh, and then the different buckets will then be taken through to a finer set of meshes. They, may, they might have one which is of a very small size. Now, <coughs> how you cut out 20, the fine material, I think he was talking, there was also a gas blown, uh, what's it called? Um, aeration, gas aeration. So based upon the principle that if you blow the powder, the very fine particles are going to want to come off with blowing through the, and, and that was being taken out and then caught probably by uh, a series of HEPA filters and something like that, capturing the really, the light material that they don't want. Um, but um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen those processes, but I haven't always, you know, fully absorbed what they're doing. <laughs> Anything else? I'm glad there's someone interested in powders. That's great. <laughs> right, so um, again, I'm going to run through this very quickly because Keith has really covered the, the key gas atomization. I call it physical processes because um, there's more to it than just the gas atomization. There's the plasma uh, atomization, which produces very good high-quality um, powder, which is also used. Um, but just to give you a bit, bit of a broader background on the different processes, I'm going to cover... Uh, a little bit here. So bore milling or mechanically alloying is just basically putting in uh, some sort of very hard material as um, balls or rods into a rotating system and uh, basically they smash together at high speed and will crumble up um, material that goes in there into, uh, into a powder form. Um, it's a, a dual process when it's mashing together, whereby it <coughs> uh, sort of welds and then they split apart and it welds. And it's kind of like, you know, um, you know, if you're working with dough and you're trying to bake bread and you split it up and mash it together again. Um, you end up with these kind of flaky materials um, look a bit like that. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are used in powder metallurgy, but they're not particularly good for something where the powder needs to flow. Obviously, looking at that, you can imagine why. It's not going to want to flow over itself, is it? Um, but it actually works because they're almost, um, it's quite flaky. They actually work very well for processes like powder compaction or hot static pressing where you've only got a unidirectional and you just squish them together like that. And they actually like to um, compact uh, that way. So they do have uh, good uses. This is this, uh, they, you do end up with a distribution. There's a distribution that's come out of bore milling. So you end up with a, you know, some larger fines, um, smaller particles. That's a typical normal distribution. But uh, the the two, the dual process, this fracturing and welding, and fracturing and welding, which is happening in the bore milling, uh, you can see it. So the the fracturing drives down, so you get smaller particles coming out, and then it welds them together again, uh, and that pushes the distribution back. So if you were monitoring this through a series of hours, you would see the, the peaks on this distribution shifting back and forward until it's settled. Uh, there are a lot of things 
that go wrong with bore milling. There's a process to take into account um, because it's quite an aggressive um, process. Uh, you, you will be getting contamination from the balls or from the, from the rods. Uh, and you need to control that and make sure that it's not going to affect your final powder. Um, so that's one way of making powders, through uh, mechanically alloying or bore milling, uh, or mechanical combination as they call it. Um, another process is to use an electrolytic process. So um, with some of these processes, you can work uh, with alloys themselves. So you could potentially work directly. In fact, you can make an alloy. That's why it's called mechanically alloying, is you could actually put 50% copper powder in, 50% aluminium powder, pure aluminium, pure, pure copper, and you come up with a binary 50-50 alloy, uh, copper, aluminium alloy. Uh, gas atomization is the same. You're coming out with a pre-alloyed powder. So you, you melt an alloy, and you make a powder in that alloy. Electrolytic is slightly different. You can't actually make, this is for making pure powders. Um, so it, it's generally a slow process. Um, it makes very fine particles on the whole, uh, but also you don't, can't work directly with um, making alloyed um, systems. Um, that summarizes that. It is high purity. So it's often the feedstock. But I mean, what you see with the literalistic processes that you'll see in that slow process of production, you'll see quite dendritic formed, quite flaky and dendritic. These are kind of uh, some of the um, uh, copper powders which are formed, and they're used for putting into inks for uh, electrical inks and things like that. Um, so there's some more pretty images. There's a lovely one down there uh, of a cobalt, which is formed in, in the shape of a leaf. Um, but not particularly, again, not particularly relevant to additive manufacturing. This is just a, the general how powders are made. These are the ones that are more relevant to um, additive manufacturing. So uh, water and gas atomization, um, and then various flavors. And Keith did run through these. And I've got a few repeat slides in here of what he showed on Monday. Um, some of these gas atomizing uh, units are more about how you actually melt the primary metal rather than the injection of gases and the collection of the powder. Um, so they will literally just change the melting head so that there's uh, possibly no contact with the crucible or a skull melting process. Um, but you could have other types of processes where you're using plasmas. Uh, you could be feeding wires in instead. So we're going to have, a, and I think he did mention those. Um, the general process does look like this. So you have a melt. You have gas is injected into a nozzle, and, a, and the melt is drip-fed through the nozzle, and the gas comes in, impinges on either side, and explosively breaks up the melt stream so that it forms very small droplets, which will then solidify as they drift down inside the cyclone and then are collected um, at the bottom. Um, all of these... Uh, that, that's the general process. So gas is when gas is used, obviously, um, and they will be using inert gases, um, so helium or argon, nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is one of the preferred ones because it's the cheapest, but a lot of um, people who work with additive manufacturing prefer to work with argon and have argon. There are some of the more reactive metals that you need to use um, argon specifically. Um, There's a, a sort of more detailed breakup, as so you can see the, 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 the melt stream coming down through the middle of these nozzles, with it, which have the, um, the gas um, uh, conduit that will impinge upon a certain point below the nozzle, and it will break it up into what it looks initially like a sheet in this area here, and then you get these ligaments, and then you get it breaking down into the droplets, and the droplets through surface tension want to go uh, and become rounded. And it's those spherical droplets that solidify, which are the ones that we're interested in collecting at the bottom. There's a, uh, a more detailed uh, sketch of these. You have, it, it, the simulation is incredibly complex. Um, and you have, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's certain frequencies that predominate, and they have an effect upon 
the size of the droplets that get formed um, afterwards and how they break up and they solidify. In fact, this simulation here was done by a group from Dublin um, and it took them the best part of five years to do this work uh, with a couple of postdocs working on it and it's literally one to, it's a two-dimensional axisymmetric um, and it's literally only maps the first few milliseconds <laughs> of the, uh, the breakup uh, and it took them forever to do that uh, and yeah I think most of us were scratching our heads going well what was the point of that you know but uh, you can do larger so that, that's a very detailed micro scale millisecond uh, simulation you can do larger scale simulations and I think I've got some results later on and they do tell you a little bit about how each of the powder not each but how groups of powder particles will solidify as they come down um, water atomization uh, this is where I think Keith described this better than I'm going to be able to because I've not had that much um, exposure to this, but um, the, it will try to uh, impinge the, um, the melt pool upon the water and we're going to splatter and then that solidifies. And it does tend to cause slightly more irregular particles than you get from gas atomization. Some of those results from the simulations, which are probably a bit more useful than, than the, the sort of small scale ones, are these ones where you actually can see uh, the tracking of different particle sizes and how they solidify as they come down within the cyclone. Um, the idea behind these simulations, you can see there, there's a 26 micron to 74 micron. They do follow different paths. They are obviously by size alone, they're going to be slightly denser, so they will, and they will be more in the core of the flow. The lighter particles are going to want to float out around the cyclone. Um, they will cool at different rates. That means they will have um, probably uh, um, slightly different microstructures when they're formed. But they will also, um, the, one of the things they, they really want to avoid with this is that you are able to uh, form nice rounded particles that don't have too many satellites. Now, if you have something which is quite big, that's taking a long time to solidify, and it's floating around inside this, the, um, not the cyclone, inside the hopper, not the hopper, um, inside that area there, if, if that's still molten, and some of the smaller particles are already solidified, they're going to want to kind of stick to the side of it. And that, that's called satelliting. And when you get satellites, if you have too many satellites on the, on the powder, that's not going to flow very well either. So they're trying to avoid getting satellites on the powder. Um, just some more. I thought here I had some videos. Uh, that shows you, uh, if you look close up at these powders, they've solidified the same way as a metal any metal or casting metal would solidify so you can start to see some very interesting microstructures are forming uh, on the actual part of, uh, powder themselves uh, you can see dendrites there and these kind of cauliflower settings so um, you can see splat caps and satellites on some of the back ones there so those are particles which they wouldn't be too happy about but you would struggle to be, from their size alone to be able to cut them out so you have to control it in the process and try to get rid of them in the process um, Uh, Keith also mentioned in his talk last Monday um, that, that the, the powder itself um, can be porous, is porous. It has a level of porosity, and some of that is acceptable and some isn't. And they use a, a method called piconometry to be able to determine whether the powder itself has got too high a level of porosity. If you've got high levels of porosity in your powder, that's going to bring a high level of porosity into your build. So you, avoid, you have to avoid that. Um, and you can see here some uh, quite detailed images where you can see porosity actually within the powder. Um, yeah, I think I did have some videos in here. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, um, there's not a lot of footage. It's quite difficult to get good footage inside a gas atomizer, but there are there are some out there. Um, this is um, uh, work done at Leeds, uh, where in order to be able to try to understand what's happening. So one, one of the problems you get with gas atomizers, which I don't think Keith went into too much detail, um, is that sometimes different metals will have a different wetting uh, to, on the nozzle. And, you, and this frequency of breakup that affects the droplets can often uh, form a precession. So you get this kind of, as you get a rotation almost. So it doesn't just come down, split out, and form a nice pillow, a billowing 
mass of powder being formed. It's kind of shaking it around inside and, and spinning around. Um, and that will cause uh, your batches of powder that are coming out to have very different size. So they, have to learn, they had to learn how to control that, those frequencies with it, which were happening. And um, it's very difficult to do that with real metal, molten metal in the, in the real one. So they'll use an analog, a water analog. Um, and they were able to do a lot of studies on water analog where they would change the, uh, the surface tension of the water by introducing surfactants and things so it would stick to different ways. And they could show that that, ten that surface tension of the water would cause different um, uh, droplets, droplet formation. The nozzle itself, this is like a black art. And if you go into a gas atomizing company like um, uh, Sandvik, they'll have some old bloke who probably can't draw in solid works to save his life, but has got all these t lovely 2D drawings of the nozzles. And he is the, the artist in the company who keeps, and there's a lot of secret know-how on the nozzles. And you will find very little out there on the actual nozzles. And they have some very specific designs for specific materials and size distributions. Um, plasma atomization uh, works using uh, um, wire. Uh, this does produce uh, very fine, uh, the, the, the plasma torches tend to be higher temperature. The process is very controlled and you get a very good mono size set of uh, high quality powder. It's also more expensive, it's a slower process. Um, so electrode induction melting uh, is quite similar to gas atomization. It's the electrode comes down, uh, is, is held. Um, let's see if I can, the, these are the ALD, um, if I can get to, I think Keith showed you this. So what I was telling you, that you can actually have different heads for the same collection unit of powder, and it's just different ways of melting uh, the, the, the top melt stream so that it doesn't get contaminated and it's appropriate for different types of alloys. Um, just comparing gas, gas atomization and plasma atomization there. Um, so Vega and Ega, vacuum induction, uh, and lecturing, uh, uh, these will produce slightly different um, size distributions. So Potentially, in a well set up company, you'll have all of those are red. When you're making a different alloy, you just change the, the, the melting head over to produce the, the um, size fractions that you want. Um, so, here the Iger has a slightly coarser um, distribution to the Viga. Um, and here they're using, for the Iger, they're using commercially pure titanium and titanium 64. So, some of the really high value powders are being produced there. The lower value cobalt chrome, zinc canal uh, powders can be produced with this Vega system here. Um, just some of the differences here, so you can see gas atomized powder on the left, and you can see water atomized powder on the right. You can see a much more angular, more predominance of slightly elongated um, forms. Um, this is a 316 stainless steel. Um, this shows some of those dendritic forms um, that you can have, uh, which will grow within the particle as it solidifies on the way down. So this is nickel, uh, nickel, uh, nickel aluminide, 75% uh, aluminum. It was used for um, um, catalytic powders. Um, and um, often they'll have a bit of microionic of titanium, which I think they've varied here. And this is, f you know, these are used in very large quantities to uh, create the various uh, chemicals. Um, one of the problems that you might not know about, which will be picked up by the piconometry and something that you really want to avoid, is this internal cavity. Uh, so often um, powders uh, which are produced using argon uh, as opposed to nitron, nitrogen are more susceptible to these uh, larger um, uh, hollow uh, interiors. And they're very difficult to pick out. Again, you would not be able to tell from the surface uh, if either of those two particles are good particles or not particles. But if they're coming into your additive process, that is highly like porosity is highly likely to stay in your part. Um, so, just one 
OK, so uh, that's covered a range of different gas atomizing, plasma atomizing, and water, uh, different systems. Um, chemical processes, um, uh, we have a um, uh, Vale, based up in uh, Clidach. They've got uh, Mon, they produce nickel. Uh, they have uh, reactors there that um, form through um, a, uh, a carbon monoxide process, uh, metal carbonyls are produced in nickel powders. So you can, and often these type of chemical processes are usually done uh, almost back to the level of the ore of the material. So uh, they don't necessarily produce powders that could be used in additives in any way, but I think companies like Valet up the road are looking for applications in additive because they can bulk produce masses of powder which then tend to get put into and actually made back into solid ingots in, 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 in large forms, uh, not directly. So obviously iron oxides to produce iron powder, iron sponge, not iron powder. Um, so this is the Hoganus process. Um, the Kroll process for producing titanium sponge. So that by producing sponge, sponges easily you can mash the sponge up at the end and come out with powder particles. Um, the uh, Sherry Gordon is a way of producing nickel powder from nickel sulfide solutions. Um, and this is the kind, if you look at the powders on the, on the, on the microscope, you can see that they're, they're not, really very, not really very usable for additive. This is why I'm skipping through this a little bit. It's just to give you a sort of broader background of different processes. Um, <laughs> Uh, chemical de de uh, decomposition, uh, metal hybrides, so um, potentially very angular, obviously not very usable. There is um, a relatively new process um, which is called plasma spheroidization. And we had, it's a French company called um, Tech, Techna. Uh, and what they can do, which can be done, is if you have a precursor powder, something like that, they can drop it into the plasma spheroidizer and it will, in a relatively slow manner, but surely, you will come out on the other side with the same quantity of material, perfectly spherical powder. Yeah? Um, so that's quite interesting because potentially you could have a large-scale chemical decomposition process like this metal hybrid uh, process which produces powder which is not useful, but potentially of good enough composition but morphology-wise, it's just absolutely not using additive. But you could put it through a plasma spheroidization sh step and come up with spherical powder. So, and, and it's that kind of large-scale use of the primary metal uh, power, primary alloys, that could be of a lot of use if this kind of additive process scales up a lot in the next 10, 20 years, where, mm, you know, many, many parts in vehicles and aircraft are being made through powder, then you're going to have to have a primary source which is very cheap and has not gone through lots of um, steps. Uh, just, this is that nickel carbonyl process which is used at Valley and uh, some of the interesting powders which are made um, there. And that's it. So, um, four main processes we've run through. The main one, the physical processes, the gas atomization processes are the ones which are mainly used for additive manufacturing. Um, and uh, that's it. So, um, that pretty much concludes everything we're going to do on powders. So, if you like it, great. If you don't, no, sorry. But it is part of the process. So, um, we have, I have got parts for you here. One thing I was going to ask you, could you fill out the survey? I don't know, have any of you done the, the survey yet for the module? I keep getting asked by admin, you've done it all? Can you do it please? And uh, the more of you the answer, the better the feedback, the more we can uh, try to improve our modules next year. Um, anyway, so we'll see you on Monday to the presentations. I've booked it from four, we've got to four to five, but I've booked it from five to six, just in case we run over a bit. Um, if you want to take your parts now, is anybody here who hasn't had the parts made?
So we're going to try to get it on next week for you. But just go into the presentation as if it was made um, and just to talk about it. I don't know what five minutes is, three or four slides. Um, you know, I think sell it. Sell it to the guys. I mean, that, that's what they're, they're hoping for. So, okay? Yeah. You can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just went along here, so anybody doesn't want to, that's fine. But if you want to go back, because I'm going to take you guys down to the lab now. Um, we'll um, put you on the tool and get your part off. And if you want to do some measurements. Yeah. Okay. But from now on, now, now, take your bags and you, you take responsibility for your bags now, for your group. Okay? 